So I'm the contact lens guy, so I'm going to give you a little brief history of contacts, my background a bit, and then we'll dive into some of the, the new things that we can do for uh, carry to So I'm ex especially excited about some of the things that have really come along in the last few years that have enabled us to fit contacts much more com comfortably for especially the difficult irregular corneas. So um, you think about it, we had Leonardo da Vinci in the 1500s, envisioned the idea of a contact lens by, he illustrated by dipping a head into a bowl of water. So he actually was the first one to conceive of a contact. Then Rene Descartes actually in 1600 came up with a, a fluid filled glass tube where he envisioned correcting vision, but it didn't work too good because you couldn't blink. So you can, you can imagine uh, the pain with that. And it lay dormant for a while and an ophthalmologist, Dr. Fick, in the late 1800s came up with an idea of a glass-blown scleral contact lens that fit largely over the corner on, onto the um, sclera. And it um, was uncomfortable and things delayed until finally around the 1940s there came along the, the plastic, flexible plastic lens, PMMA, that was uh, frankly had good optics and could be lathed and was made small to fit over a little bit bigger than the size of your pupil. And it was amazing uh, how that um, actually took off and had mass appeal by about the 1960s. So, um, and then it, it, it kind of exploded from there in terms of materials and designs off of the corneal contact, which is still with, with us and still a lot of what I do, the corneal contact lens for keratoconus. So my partner, Steve Downs, hooked up early on with a guy named Dave Ewell, whose brother was over at Czechoslovakia working with a guy named Otto Workerly with spin-casted soft lenses in the early 60s. And he uh, brought some of those home to uh, the United States and uh, didn't have the wherewithal. He was a Berkeley, kind of a cross between a hippie and a cowboy. I would describe Dr. Ewell, very nice man and bright. But he really came up with the, uh, the early soft lens designs in America and uh, um, made this first soft torque that actually worked. So we, we kind of went from, if you can imagine, the corneal contacts that didn't really supply much oxygen. We had drilled holes in them to um, the soft lens, which was immediately popular and had mass appeal because of the, the ability for the lens to lay down and feel comfortable immediately. And then, and then we got gas permeable materials for the hard lenses that were terrific. We now talk only about gas permeable rigid lenses, which um, really fit very well and provide a lot of oxygen. And then we started developing the silicone hydrogels, which are soft lenses that supply a lot of oxygen and then became disposable with the cast molding systems, inexpensive and can be made cheaply and disposed of. So that's kind of where we are now. We basically got two basic kinds of lenses, right? Soft lenses over here and then the rigid gas permeables over here with a lot of subsets. So I'll, I'll begin talking about those. So Matt already covered this. I don't spend any time on this. this. You can kind of see the profile of the cornea is coning and therefore causes uh, a problem with contact lenses in terms of fit because um, when you have a dynamic lens moving on the eye, especially the corneal lens is historically where you fit, you can imagine the problem. The lens moves and it always wants, the lens always wants to go to the apex or the foremost the foremost elevated area of the cornea. So mostly the corneas have cones that are inferior, as you can see in this picture. So we're always struggling with the movement of a lens with different curvatures moving across a cornea with a variety of different curvatures. So this is the challenge that we have in designing a good contact lens that's comfortable. There's, um, there's a lot of distortions, most of which we can eliminate with a hard contact lens surface that eliminates that irregular topography that Matt spoke of. So um, here you can kind of get a sense. This isn't even what it is. I imagine you guys can tell me better, but there's really the secondary images and the, the shadows and, and the kind of the, 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 double, the doubleness that you get in certain patches within the visual fields that are the challenges. So this is what um, we're, we're up against. And when we, uh, we look really at the contact lens, uh, we're trying to eliminate a lot of these distortions, which can be done especially when most of the distortions are on the surface of the cornea, although some are on the back of the cornea. I've come to recognize those more and more over my, my career fitting contact lenses is that the distortions from the back or the posterior side of the cornea can affect the vision greatly, and those are hard to deal with. But um, you can see the topography, as Matt described, it's asymmetric, where you have a lot steepening down below, which is very common, uh, keratoconus, and um, oftentimes, over, over time, you can get scarring of the cornea, which is a, a problem 
and this is what leads to corneal transplants in many cases. You can't see through scars, and so we are, it's very important that a contact lens fitter and a contact lens fits on your eye properly so that we don't have excess of bearing all over that apex or that cone. You imagine, we've known this for years, and it, it's, it's where we surmised it, but I became more convinced over, over my career that looking at lenses were flat fitting and laying against the cornea excessively bearing would cause scars, and that they certainly do. And uh, Chris Kenny, I know, has done a lot of work on the origins and the etiology of uh, scarring on corneas, and I'm, I'm convinced that flat-fitting, heavily bearing lenses are a big part of that. So how do we get around that? Um, well, one, we can start with spectacles. I'll make a few comments just clinically, you should be aware. There's many times in my office that I end up with glasses that are quite functional. And one of the problems with contact lens wear at keratoconus is that people overwear their contact lenses excessive hours because it's the main modality that they can see with. Now this is all well and good, but let's, let's be honest, the, uh, the use of glasses can be very helpful. And um, I take a lot of pains, it's not a lot of fun doing refractions at times with irregular corneas. We're, we're smiling and dialing as I call it, where we take the lens and I'll, I'll actually have the, the knob and I'll hand it over to the patient for the astigmatism because these are such irregular corneas, doing my typical testing doesn't work, so I allow you guys to just grab that knob and help me out. So we're throwing a bunch of lenses up. My goal is that I can get, in as many cases, and it's not, not all the cases, in fact, there's many cases I can't. Glasses, frankly, don't work at all, but we can often get glasses that are functional. So I would, I would uh, put that little bug in your ear that don't give up on glasses um, despite their monocular ghost images and, and the problems they have. Proper frame selection is important too because the prescription is usually quite high and the peripheral distortions are quite large. Just remember smaller frames where you're looking through the optical center so that a frame that's geometrically centered over your face is much easier to fit a pair of glasses. This is a common mistake when uh, people don't see these real high RXs sometimes, the local dispensers, um, they don't get the kind of frames that fit so you're looking more geometric through the center of the lens, which eliminates the thickness and some of the distortions peripherally in the glasses. So, um, so soft torques are an option too. Um, I'm going to kind of build up to the ones that have the best visual options here. But soft torques are terrific. Uh, frankly, um, we were um, when I first started at Praxis in '82. That's all we did. We did the FDA study for the soft torque lens, and that's. All we had, we had apartment complex, was full of soft torques in the back, we had about 10,000 of those lenses, and we just started trying them on our keratoconus patients, keratoconus patients when they came out. And it was surprising, because the lens is a little thicker, it's got a prism weight in it to help stabilize the astigmatism, as you understood, match to the football shape. One, one meridian, that is the horizontal, is not the same as the vertical meridian, so we stabilize with the prism. Well, the prism's thicker, and the prism actually covers up, we found, due to the thickness, some of the irregularities of the keratoconus. Uh, a lot of people still wear soft torques. They're doing marvelously well. And they have a side benefit sometimes is they ha hit the 40 and up where they need the reading glasses, where accommodation is not as good. It allows us to still benefit from the inferior curvature, which has kind of a bifocal effect. Can you imagine? So these people, uh, surprisingly, will be wearing soft torque lenses and not using bifocal lenses well into their 50s. So one of the advantages of soft torques in mild keratoconus, not in all cases. And you know, the, the traditional um, use of, um, of the uh, hard lens is still what we do, the corneal lens. I do still a good majority of my patients are still doing quite well with rigid lenses or corneal. Uh, they're obviously more difficult again because we have to get the right kind of curvatures. Proper edge design, these lenses are usually between 8 and 10 millimeters and can work famously. Um, at times, um, there is new designs now, as I mentioned here at the bottom of the slide, is the piggyback system where we have a soft lens where it actually reshapes the cornea and gives us a different shape so that we can fit the contact more easier and it allows actually a more stable positioning of the lens and the comfort's better because about half or at least of the discomfort is corneal nerve related, not just lid. And, um, people are more comfortable. So for centration and for purposes of comfort, oftentimes we have uh, piggybacks are quite, quite good. And the inset below is a, a company uh, called FlexLens has a piggyback 
lens system where they uh, grab the soft lens and they just scooped out the front of the soft lens so that the hard lens and the edge is now, as you can kind of picture, right here is kind of set down. Right there is that inset. You see that little inset? The hard lens drops right in there and you don't get the movement of the hard lens. It kind of just sits in there. The movement's not that critical on the lens and with the new oxygen probabilities of the silicone hydrogels, more oxygen through the soft and the hard. They work surprisingly well. They're thicker, and I used to worry about them originally, lack of oxygen, but quite frankly now, I like this system. It um, helps me center quite a few cases, and the piggyback um, has made a comeback in my mind. Uh, so um, there's a little more art to this than there's science at, at times, I think, after having lived, breathed, and dreamed it for four, four decades, waking up and dreaming contacts in the air. <laughs> waking up thinking about piggyback lenses, but you know, they, they work quite well and we've, um, we've kind of gotten more oxygen permeability in the last five to 10 years out of the soft. And I just kind of went back and I, I'll do this occasionally where I'll, it's some of this approach actually is, let's try two modalities on that eye and let's see which wins. And then we'll try another modality on that eye and we'll play competition. And it's surprisingly um, how, how often the piggyback um, works, despite the hassles of the, the two lens systems and, so, so the corneal rigid lens we're just talking about, just straight up, the advantage of these are simple, right? You get more oxygen, it's one lens only, easier to care for, um, and they fit just over the cornea. They're typically 8 to 10 millimeters. They have a steep central optic zone that will center over the cone or the apex of the keratoconus. And as, you, as Matt kind of described, and I'll re, you know, review, is now the front of the eye becomes the front of the hard lens, which eliminates a large majority of the distortions that you experience. So the key thing is in the fit that we don't want to get a lens bearing too much on the top one and the A is bearing excessively. The one on the B is, is excessively clearing. It's too steep and you get a peripheral seal off and this will kind of get a kind of a tight feel, hard to remove and uh, they get that dark ring on the outside which just kind of sucks down and the lens stops moving. So you have you know, different Kind of these bottom ones are quite frankly steep too, and again excessively steep on the bottom one. The one on the top is close. I like to have what we call light touch on these corneal design lenses where they're um, about a millimeter or two centrally of touch, and that's it. So I call it a light feather touch, and um, light touch with minimal bearing on the apex and distribute the weight across the lens. Anyhow, so, um, but one of the, you know, there's another one you might not try that actually is surprising. This one I caught on to about 10 years ago, a Dr. Breeze out in Virginia was actually uh, in the U.S., kind of one of the founders of the scleral lens designs. Um, he was uh, starting to make soft lenses because of the new materials we have with soft lenses that supply a lot more oxygen. There's the Novacone, the BNL, Car BNL Carasoft, Naturasoft. These are just thick soft lenses. Their uh, normal contacts about 0.1 millimeters thick. These are about 0.4 millimeters thick, four times thicker. And what does that thickness do? Well, it's got a stiffer material, and it acts kind of like a hard lens. It covers up some of the irregularities. So what you actually are getting with that is um, you know, significantly better vision. With the comfort of the soft, no decentration, no dust getting in, all the advantages of the soft lens. And glasses can be worn over the top to pick up a little of the stigmatism that may not be uh, completely you know, corrected. So um, that's another option. Soft lens, keratoconus soft lenses are uh, terrific. So, but okay, so here's the squirrels. You know, he kind of cued me up for that. And uh, um, Don Ezekiel was a very bright guy, known him over the years. And, uh, and um, he actually gave him a recognition at the last. This global contact lens, especially all these people that contacts all over the world come. And um, they gave him a recognition because he was grinding these, making these squirrels back in Australia in the 80s. And um, I, I actually worked in Australia for about six months at the University of New South Wales. And uh, he was involved there. And, they were doing molds, and I remember it was at that time, they were just coming out with the gas permeables, and they just hadn't quite figured it out, and it didn't really take off for some reason, you know. And they, they were just cutting off oxygen, and the landing zones weren't right. But he really had started this idea where they thought, well, wait a minute, um, the cornea with all its irregularities are hard to fit with these mobile lenses, and so if we can vault the lens, the, the corneal curvatures and the designs become much simpler in the central zone, but the problem is how much vault do we get and how much, how much angle should we land on the sclera and uh, what happens you know, with scleral lenses. So yeah, these, 
These two uh, gentlemen are uh, really the pioneers. Uh, Rob Breeze here in America was uh, um, an optometrist. He also had a lab. I worked with him in the, uh, 2002 and 3, and he was really at the front end of what was happening. He developed a lot of the lenses of Perry Rosenthal over the Boston Foundation. So um, this is um, this is a big move in uh, keratoconus fitting now, in my opinion. Um, especially transplant fitting and the all blade corneas where you're flatter in the middle and you have the mid peripheral steepening. So um, we are, um, I'm starting to fenestrate lenses to allow a little more oxygen, but it's difficult because a lot of times when we fenestrate, we get these air bubbles. If you don't fenestrate them in the right place, and I quite frankly haven't figured it out, but we're playing with it. But we're finding now that um, oxygen delivery with proper landing zones, higher oxygen and permeable materials, quite frankly, are, are doing quite well with the scleral lenses now. So it's not for. Do you want to explain what fenestration means? Oh, it's all. Well, yes, well, th thank you for cueing me up on that. That's, that's a little hole right here. And um, basically, fenestration is we drill little holes. We used to drill holes in the old lenses that were non permeable back in the 70s. Um, three little holes in the middle of these eight millimeter lenses. Why? Well, more oxygen. Because the PMMA materials back then supplied no oxygen. We're all dependent on tear flow. And so we drilled holes, but we started. Um, playing around with this now, drilling holes and fenestrations, it's not too popular now, but I, I think there's something to this here, so we can get better tear flow. That's one of the problems with sclerosis, we don't get a lot of tear flow underneath there. Do these so, lenses not have fluid underneath the... Yeah, so well, these lenses do have fluid, you're, you're inserting them. The fact is, another advantage of sclerals is they do provide a moisture chamber, and it, for the dry eye, it's been another advantage of sclerals. But you know, it's funny, on the landing zones, they, we kind of found that the landing zones on the first couple millimeters of the sclera really aren't as curved as we thought. This is an old drawing of the eye, but it's really not this way. This being the clear cornea, and then suddenly here's right, this niche is where cornea have this curved sclera. Well, it's not really how the eye is designed. We kind of found out with playing with these sclera lenses that it's more of a tangent or a straight line for the first couple millimeters of the sclera, right, where it meets the cornea. So we suddenly, it's really just happened over the last two years, we're suddenly, we're starting to figure out that those landing zones need to be a little wider and a straight line. And I'm getting a lot better landing zones now. We're not, not digging in and are not sealing off. And we've had some success with that. Um, and we try to get a, the key thing is getting a vault right over where the junction of the cornea and the scleral meets. A little bit of vault. It's hard to get your head around 80 microns, but it's a small amount of tears in there. And then in the middle, we kind of try to get 250 microns of clearance. And that, that gives us the right optics without, if the tear film gets too thick, it gets kind of foggy. If the tear film gets too thin, it starts and it does settle, starts touching the cornea and then grinding down and that's something we don't want either. So we work with this landing zone, it's kind of like the rise and the run of the roof. You try to get the roof to rise but you don't get the roof to get too steep on the landing and so you, you kind of you're playing with that and these, these things along with these reverse geometry designs have, have made a big difference in the way we uh, make square lenses. So, um, but you can kind of see, you see if they land too steep, boy you get a big compression right there. You just kind of you push on the vessels and you get a ring, and that's a problem, you know. But you can see how they work, right? That, that fluorescein here tells you the. Yeah, I was just going to point out you might show them that the fluorescein is in the tear film and trapped by the lens. So yeah, you can see what exactly. Tony, Tony's making a good point here is uh, uh, that diagram, uh, that lower picture actually points out what's actually happening. That that green is the fluorescein, which is tinting the saline and the tear combination. We're filling the bowl of the contact, right? with the saline and we're putting it on looking straight down that shows you there's no touch of the cornea at all that's complete vault this is a non-touching vaulting lens and if there um, was touch it would be blue and no yeah you yeah, would see any green the green would be pushed out it wouldn't be fluorescing and therefore you'd be seeing touch and bearing essentially which is a big no big no no so we fill the bowl with saline and we use the plungers that i can show you in my bag afterwards if you'd like to look Multiple designs. Most of the lenses are between 15 and 18 millimeters. The average cornea is about 12-ish. So we, we try to get... The lenses started out, when I was working with Dr. Breeze, you know, 18 and a half-ish, and this starts coming down. I'm kind of in favor of the smaller sclerals, and the landing zones seem to be easier at the uh, 16 millimeter range at this point. Now there is an option of a hybrid lens. Um, not, a, not on the top of the list for me that it comes out the gate, but it's, it's a legitimate option and provides um, basically a hard lens melded with the soft. It centers the hard lens beautifully. The edge of the hard lens is buried within the soft, so the comfort's terrific. There is a little problem with the sealing off with these, frankly, because the, 
the soft and the hard connection tend to have a kind of like pulling, pulling the drapes down and pulls the hard lens to the eye. So I have some ceiling with these designs and they're not my first choice, but they, they do work. A pellucid marginal degeneration. Um, these, these are tricky. These, that's kind of the form of keratoconus where we, um, the apex or the steepness of the cornea is way down at the margin. And uh, here, these are very difficult because now these were, frankly, the hybrid lenses have helped. Why? Because we're not worried about the lens. If you put a cornea lens on a pellucid eyeball, you can imagine what happens is it goes straight down and the lens sticks down to the inferior sclera, inferior cornea, and seals. So we found the hybrids were a big boon to me when, uh, for these kinds of curvatures and the sclerals too. So for the difficult um, situations, um, why we jump to those. Now the oblate corneas, for those who raise your hand with the corneal transplants, that's where, that's the kind of profiles that when we fit contacts we're dealing with, which is flat in the middle, and it's reverse steepening in the mid-periphery, and you can kind of see how um, difficult it is. There's a corneal lens that I fit, but you can see the difficulty. It's, it's flat here, but it's really asymmetric. It's, it's, it's flat here, but there's a much more steepening on this side of the cornea. And um, the, the, the contact lens always goes, remember, to the highest elevation. So there it goes, goes running a little more nasally. So you got a lot more bearing here. And you got, you got the vaulting over the flatter central. But it's, again, pushing to the side with the highest elevation. So this is a challenge with the, the oblate corneas. So we, um, we found, as I mentioned earlier, that the scleral lenses probably work better in those cases because we're vaulting over that area, stabilizing and centering with the sclera. Yeah, so the contact lens care is important to know. This is good for you folks out there kind of wondering where all the solution choices are. It, gets, it can be a blur. I, I have found that um, generally with this corneal lens and the standard, Optimum or Boston, I didn't know the Boston up here for some reason, they're just standard cleaners. You know, I kind of like the Lobob because it has one part of the system that they basically took the wetting and the cleaning, cleaner and they mixed it and said stored in that. So the overnight storage is just a mix of the wetting and the cleaner. So it's like soaking your dishes overnight in the sink, they're nice and clean, right? My 13-year-old does that every night. Um, but the, um, then the Proxite systems, I still use for my hard lenses for people that get film. The Proxite has a, you know, a, a basically an effervescence to it and a disinfecting that helps the surface of the lens become clean different, in a different way and attacks a different kind of a protein in the lipids than just the, day, the standard cleaner. So if somebody's having a hard time, I'll jump to the peroxide system, which is either the proxy clear or the clear pair up in the corner. So those are a little tricky because they have a little zinc disc and it has to neutralize the peroxide and you can't touch that peroxide and get in your eye for four hours or you'll know it. So I'm, we've had those course in the office where the lens is pulled out and put in prematurely and it burns. So um, those, are the, uh, those are the main options. The top two, the OptiFree and the BioTrue, there's Revital Lens is another good one from AMO. These are all good. Um, these are just saline, which are all-in-one saline uh, solutions for your soft lenses and can be used for the hard storage also. So um, when I use the saline, um, I usually use these for disinfecting the scleral overnight, but we found because of the lower tear exchange underneath the, uh, underneath the scleral lenses, not a good idea to have the preservative solutions like OptiFree or BioTrue in there all night, all day long. So we, we found out, I used to use the Unisol and they're kind of, the problem with those, you open the bottle and you have this big bottle of non-preserved saline. So what do you do with that? Well, you fill the bowl of this and you can fill about, you know, I don't know, 100 bowls of that and that stuff's going bad within about a week or two. So we found the Adipack, which was, um, they were using these for all types of, but it's 0.9% saline and it works perfect. You just go right on Amazon and have all my people with scleral lenses using the non-preserved Adipack mm -hmm. as a way of keeping non-preserved saline in touch with your eye during the course of the day. And then you disinfect, you disinfect the contact lens uh, overnight with the standard solution. I want the disinfection and the cleaning, but um, still, uh, you know, the Adipack is a great idea for the non-preserved sclerals. Um, I still do, even with sclerals, the peroxide system because one of the problems with sclerals is they're not moving and they're a larger surface and they're a high oxygen permeable material with these silicone fluorine. So the surface of the lens um, is nice to have um, a peroxide cleaning occasionally at least once or twice a week. And um, for people especially get film, I've had a lot of success with the proxy clear. Proxy clear just came out with one they claim it's kind of a reverse, it's, it's kind of indented. So it kind of lays on the inside of the base curve more flush 
I wish they would have made it a little bigger from some of the larger ones, but it might fit a little better than the clear care in terms of the sclerals. But uh, that's a nice little summary of the uh, solutions. So yeah, I'm getting them in and out, I guess, because the scleral discussions kind of come to the forefront. Um, so, funny thing I found out about the scleral lens is one of the problems we have film on them is the little plungers that we um, remove them with. There's really two sets of plungers. There's one plunger that has no hole in it. You can see the ones that have little holes. I actually cut the bottom of this out so you can look at the bottom. But normally this one doesn't have a cutout. It's just as this, but that's your releasing plunger, right? That's your, your plunger that you put the lens on with with the scleral because you can't put the sclerals on like this because all the saline will fall out. You have to fill the bowl and you got to look straight down. And you're putting it on like this with the plunger. Once, once it hits your eye and you have attachment, you just squeeze the plunger and now you've released the plunger. The other plunger that you have up there does not have that hole and doesn't have a suction to it and it's just stuck on there and it's for removal. It has a much more distinct place of pressure and there's a there's really a, it's kind of like the garage door as I described it. You grab your garage door from down here and you pick it up. It's much easier to get your garage door up. I guess we all have electronic ones nowadays. <laughs> I kind of kind of miss the old garage doors. But yeah, you pick up you get get better leverage at the bottom of the lens. And same thing with the score lens. Or suction. If you put that suction lens right in the middle of that lens, it ain't coming off, right? Because you got equal grab all the way around. If you put it at six o'clock at the edge of the lens with a smaller plunger, like these top plungers. We actually just got one recently. It's got a 45 degree angle that I'm playing around with. That I think works maybe a little better. They are the one on the right, they're the same thing. But those, those are terrific for removal. And I actually have been using those for uh, people who say, ah, oh, my lenses have got a little, got a little film. And I said, well, let's put some lubricants in and during the day use it as a squeegee. You just kind of take that little plunger and go, and squeeze it around. And then you can slide it off the edge of the lens onto the white part of the eye. It works quite well. I was kind of surprised. I used to take the lenses out and clean them, go with my shenanigans. And um, I just started doing this recently, and they, uh, what do you mind kind of putting that out to me? I thought, that's a good idea. You know, you just clean them with the plunger in there. It's like you're squeezing your window shield or something. So um, I got the O-rings recently, too, because I, I, I kind of find these were pretty good. They're a little bit of a hassle because they kind of stick to the lens a little bit, and you have to pick it out. But, I mean, the plungers can be kind of cumbersome, but you can put the, the O-ring on your finger, and it's, um, for those that are already been wearing hard lens all years, they're kind of fairly dexterous and fairly, you know, good with their hands here. Adept and they can just put it right on and the, the, the O-ring, the O-ring actually serves, you imagine, with a big lens to stabilize the lens. You can't put a scleral lens in your hand and balance it unless you can walk, walk uh, you know, tight ropes or something, right? It's, it's a tough balance. So the O-ring works fairly well. I use two fingers for mine. You do? Yeah, okay, good. It's way easier than the plunger. Yeah, you like it better than the plunger? See there? Yeah, no, that's good. I, I, try, I have trained people try to they do the tripod or the two finger and yeah that's yeah I, I actually I encourage it on all my patients now I'm trying to I'm starting to move in a direction of just starting to do this is if let's see if we can get this out out without the plunger and get them in without the plunger because the plungers are a problem because if you don't have your plunger with you now it becomes an emergency you know you, I can't get this thing out so there's ways of getting them in and out without plungers and we've got one hero in the crowd here there's not too many of you by the way most people give up on it when we try. Yeah. So, Jerry, did you ever try that? How do you get it out without a plunger? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well yeah, we're, that's a little tricky. It's basically a, you're pushing down to the lower lid and you're stabilizing the upper lid and you push. It's, we, yeah, it, yeah I, have to, I have to show you in the office next time. Yeah, but it's tricky. We'll do a video next time. Yeah, yeah, the video, yeah. Yeah. So um, anyhow, do I have anything else to say on these routine cleaning, previous plungers? I don't think that's it. That's it for you.